The Earnestly Speaking Podcast is a show that is founded on free-flowing conversation and may at times venture into mature subjects. Listener discretion is advised. Yeah, Earnestly Speaking Podcast. Let's get it. I'm a giant in New York, in Miami, carry heat. So much more in store, my product can flood the street. Opinion Nation, Godfather, CEO. Pop in the late 90s, gon' see me blow. Oh. Got my hustle on, no imitation of bad. Army of untouchables, Opinion Nation staff. Never an off season, homie. Check the numbers. Heart drop in my own right, supply your southern comfort. Earnestly speaking, my ego is well fed. Earnestly speaking, you're too feeble and no threat. See him like a hurricane. You're a mild breeze. Earnestly speaking, leaving Eli a dynasty. Shame. Earnestly speaking podcast coming to you September 12th, 2024. Look who's back. It's one of, one of our favorites here. One of the uh, longest uh, uh, people or persons or whatever. <laughs> what was that? Dude, just, I'm adorable. That's what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Francois, friend and actress of the show. How you doing, Mark? I'm well, man. I'm very well indeed. Coming to you from my beautiful bedroom today. I, uh, don't, I don't have my normal studio little setup going on, so uh, yeah. we're making things work. But uh, yeah. here we are. Yeah, couldn't I, I, couldn't miss this after the debate. And yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm 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 glad you sh- took off the uh, daughter's hat. Like you know, <laughs> that one was filthy. That although, one was filthy. Yeah, yeah. Although I I, 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 I be honest, last time we spoke on the podcast, like the Mets were in this in this dog shit, and now they're right now in the wild card. Wait, I forget. No, I think we had one in between that was at the beginning of the Grimace run. I think they yes, were like yes, yes, six, yes. They were like six but, or seven games into right. the Grimace because it was. Yeah. I had gone to uh, City. Uh, I yes. want to say it was like May twenty eighth, twenty ninth, something like that. Yeah, and we yeah. no, no, no. It was before because we beat up on them. Okay. Um, and then I want to say within like a week of that is when the grimace thing happened and their season started turning around and things started looking up and and then I think the Yankee oh you know what it was in June because I had gone to both City and Yankee Stadium. That's when we met when we talked because the Yankees and Mets had flip flopped since our previous conversation. The Yankees yeah. were going through it, yeah. and the Mets were starting to look like a professional baseball team again. And it, and, and they still, still look like one apparently. It was just fucking yeah. crazy. And the playoffs started today. They'd be they'd be the Walker. Met, yeah, you got <laughs> fucking the uh, Phillies and the Dodgers going back and forth for the best record in the National League, and the Mets yeah. and the Padres just won't go away. Yeah, either division. Very frisky, very frisky times. But yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned the debate, man. This is why we're here. Um, you know, this is this podcast for 13 years. You know, Mark and I, we always talk politics on here, especially during election years. It's always been a thing we've been doing for quite a long time, and it doesn't change now. We are right now well past the something stretch of the of the uh, of the of the uh, this political uh, cycle. We're seven weeks away from the election, buddy. This is crazy. I'm not ready for it to be that deep into fall yet. I'm. I'm like. Neither am I. Put away the fucking pumpkin spice. I'm still drinking margaritas. <laughs> Leave me alone. Like, ask my wife. Though. My wife. My wife's all over the pumpkin stuff already now. Oh like, no. She's, she's, she's one of those. Yeah. Well, and it's crazy too now because it's like you go to you know Target is kind of the indicator of where you are in the in the the calendar, and it's like Fourth yeah. of July. Like Fourth of July goes out. Yeah. And then as soon like by July second, they've got. The Fourth of July stuff in the clearance section. Yeah. The school supplies are out, yeah. and you're like, "Huh? What?" I mean, parents yeah. are obviously excited because they're like, "Yeah, shit's right around the corner. I get rid of these little." I'm not gonna lie. We're already talking I'm about. Talk, we're already talking about the holidays now. We're already talking about the holidays, not my house. I mean, it's kind of something I am starting to do more in my life, but only because I live on the opposite side of the country from most of the people I would celebrate the holidays with, and that requires a little planning and budgeting. But yet, yeah, historically, that was never my vibe. And the we- and also <laughs> I just the don't have a choice now. <clears throat> and I feel like also the weather dictates that. Like, like in New York, obviously in New York, you you feel Christmas pretty early because cold weather starts coming in about. La- like, so so last year was definitely like that. Where I want to say, you know, September twenty first or whatever is the equinox, <clears throat> and like I swear to God, on the twenty second, we were all standing out in front of the the little like local watering hole where I hang out, and it mm-hmm. was probably. Like 45 or 50 degrees 
mm-hmm. and we're looking at each other. We're like, what the fuck? It's been fall for like 45 minutes. <laughs> what the hell? Like, I was like, man, y'all don't play with these seasons here. <laughs> Came with a bag, and, brother. Came with a bag. Yeah, well, and and I well, so and I live right by the water too. So, oh, really? On the uh, on the Atlantic side, yeah, I'm on the oh, south wow. shore. Of, I'm on the Ooh. south shore of Long Island. So, um, extra crispy. Yeah, you feel that. Like it was funny because I was working for uh, I was I was working with this organization. I was helping them out with some stuff uh, last last winter, and they're on the North Shore on the Sound side. Right. And what I did not realize is that on any given day, we will be 10 degrees colder or at least feel 10 degrees colder with probably anywhere from five to 25 miles an hour more wind than whatever they're dealing with on the North Shore side. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I'm born in New York. I miss those days, but I don't miss yeah. the freezing cold. Although, again, like we talked. We talked about this last year too. Like New York winter's not that bad, dude. It's not Edmonton. It's not Minnesota. Well, you, you but know. again, you 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 did Edmonton though for a couple of years. Yeah, like, and like I, was. I mean, and I traveled enough for business. I'm in Chicago in the winter. I had to go to like this sales conference in Minneapolis in January. Yeah. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> What's that? Oh, that was pretty cool actually. The uh, little thumbs up there. Yeah, I hadn't seen that See before. That? We got live. We got live viewers. Well, no, 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 no. Oh. That this came out nowhere. I guess I don't know. Hmm. Okay. Maybe from, maybe from your phone, I guess. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. Okay. All right. So now that's on the way. The debate was two uh, two nights ago. Mm-hmm. Um, I My mean, brain still watch- hurts. Yeah. <laughs> the more you realize, we did a watch. <laughs> I did a watch along actually. With a watch party with, with with it, and that was a lot of fun. But I guess let me ask you guys. Uh, ask you rather. Um, what is your takeaway? Biggest takeaway from the debate? It was exactly what I expected it to be. That, that would probably be my overarching takeaway. There, on one side, I had a grown-up that I agree with probably 65%, 70%, and I have some pretty stark disagreements with on a couple of positions debating an 80-year-old child. Like, that man can't string three sentences together. It is We are so past the point of, like, Oh, Trump says wild things or, you know, Trump said a racist thing. Trump can't say things anymore. Like words are are leaving his mouth, but I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. You know what's funny though? Mark, you know what's funny though? I, so this is like yesterday, actually, I I actually watched a 27 minute compilation of Donald Trump's like 2015, 2016 campaign. Yeah. And, and look, even whether or not you agree or disagree with him and all this stuff, there's a stark difference to him. Then he could speak in complete now. sentences. I yeah. didn't like the sentences he was saying, but he could at least complete them. He was like peak level insult comic. Great. <laughs> Back then. Like he was even, even his populist message was, was more coher- coherent. Yeah. You know? There was a reason his, his rallies did in fact have, <clears throat> excuse me, thousands of people in 15 and 16. Like that was a thing. I wasn't happy about it, but it was a thing right. now. Like, yeah, no, it's, it's, because, you know, it's kind of what we talked about last time, too, as soon as uh, Joe Biden announced his departure. And that was. You. <sighs> Did we podcast even that? there's a whole lot of people that have been historically Republican, especially pl- in places like here in suburban California, probably in your neck of the woods, mm-hmm. where you have people that are going to hold their nose and vote for Kamala Harris because they go, this man has lost his mind. He is not fit. He is not well. I just realized the last pod we did was in July. Okay. And and that pod was right, I think it was literally two days. I think it was the day or two after Joe Biden. No, no, before, before, before. That's right. That's right. Because we we recorded on like Thursday or Friday and he announced on on Sunday. Sunday. Right. That's what it was. He announced on the 19th, I believe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. That's right. We should, we should kind of before we go to debate, we should kind of go back to that real quick first because we have we have we've had so much happen since then. I know we spoke after the, the Trump. Yeah, that's it was funny because we talked on the phone and texted so much when that shit all right. hit the fan. I just right. assumed we potted. <laughs> so and I know we didn't react to the Trump assassination attempt. We knew that 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 yeah. I remember. Um, but this was what's happened since then. So let's go back to the Biden thing first. We'll get to the debate in a second. Um, your thoughts on how it was handled and all that stuff. It was late, but other than that, it was done about as well as it could have been. That that would probably be my only that would be my only real overarching takeaway is just a little more runway for 
uh, Vice President Harris and, and Governor Walls, but otherwise, it's fine. Fine. I, I, I'm, I'm relieved more than anything. So I'm like, mm, okay, fine. You were a little late to the party, but, but you know, better late than never. I, better than Joe Biden still being on the ballot in November. Do you agree with the way it was handled? I don't there's a, there's really a, there's know another way. I, 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 I guess I do, but I don't. It's more not because I think, oh, my God, that was so wonderful. I couldn't have pictured something. But it's more just because I can't um, I, I, I can't kind of imagine another way it would have been done. It's like it was messy. You were kind of like. The toothpaste was out of the tube in a lot of ways because, like, the president had announced he was going to run you know, long ago, earlier in his term, uh, he had said he had every intention of seeking reelection. And, and then he started out the campaign. And, you know, I, I, you know, maybe before he had started campaigning would have been a better time to say, you know, I thought about it. And I really just don't have the zip to do this and don't want to continue. I don't, you know, whatever. He was, but, forced, out of, he was forced out of the paint though. Let's be clear about that. Nancy Pelosi did, did the whole, uh, Either you're gonna go or make you go, kind of thing. Let's be real about that. It's all bullshit. Yeah, well, I I would bet it was probably as much as family as anything, too. That was probably what put it over the <clears> edge. Is <throat> you know, I don't because I I see Joe as a or President Biden as a very stubborn person. And oh, a question when when threatened or when confronted, I see him as a person probably more inclined to dig in his heels uh, when when he feels like his back is against the wall. So while in in function, the, say, threat of donors, threat of Speaker Pelosi, whomever, um, may have, you know, from the outside appeared to be like the, the core of it. I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was probably a lot more to do with Dr. Jill and his kids. You know, Dr. Jill loves the role of First Lady and probably didn't want to do it, but she probably, she probably saw it right in the way. I, yeah, I, it's more like I think. The family saw that debate and went, guys, no, come on, we can't do this. Well, yeah, especially to me, I, I, I don't know if you got this from people around you in your personal life. I know I got that a lot in the last two months. But the frustrating part for me leading up to that was the fact that I know you and I both have been on, a, on, a, on the same wavelength with this whole situation. We were saying two years ago, two years ago at, at the midterms, that even though – Democrats did stop the red wave. It didn't happen. We 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 both said it. We did a podcast the day after that, saying that we hope this is not a a thing where Biden says, "Oh, now I'm viable. I can still run." We said he still got to go. Well, and I mean, we even have been saying it really since 2020. Is yeah. that Biden needed to be a torch passer, not a right. torch bearer? Yeah, you know. And it would really be it would really be preferable that he only be around for one term. Like, I, I think, I, you know, we said that before before Donald Trump took his idiots to the Capitol. Yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, was it band did, of did, morons? <laughs> yeah. Did, 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 did you uh, have an issue with the primary or lack of primary process and how Kamala was because. I, I there's still I, I believe there's still a legitimate argument that there should have been a primary at the at the convention to let to me that's that's real democracy is that the people decide. I don't know the like nuts and bolts of how that all works and like what the specifics of yeah. you know why that argument has merit. I won't I'm not gonna go down that road. Mm -hmm. But just to say I agree. Um I do wish it could have been a more democratic process than it was. But I don't really know how it could have been given the circumstances and when the president decided to step aside and, you know, right. um, could, you know, had he, you know, had he just gone into the campaign season and said, thanks, but no thanks, might have been able to have some primaries. But it's like, you know, once once you started ripping off Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, it's like it, it would have had to at the very least happen before Super Tuesday because nobody had a campaign like. Right. You know, and, and, nobody, and, and, had a, yeah. nobody had a war chest. Like, and, and, right, and that's the thing, too. Also, the, the, the laws are that it's only transferable to Kamala Harris because she's on the ticket. So the, that, that was the prudent decision. Yeah, because otherwise you were going to you were going to lose hundreds of millions of dollars in donations, if not billions. Right. 
Exactly. Go, go by the wayside. Yeah. So it, it makes yeah. sense. And like I said, Kamala, as you've seen in the last now near two months now since this whole thing happened, way more upside down than 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 Biden. She's polling much better than she would Biden. Look, there's no question that Joe Biden was on the way to a, a defeat of Donald Trump. And I, I would argue not just I mean, we said that she was, we said that she was in the bag basically as soon as he said he was running. Yeah, I, I would say you not just electorally, but I, I would argue the popular vote also too. He might have lost that to us as well. Narrowly, but yes. Yes, narrowly, but yes, right. So they, they did the right thing here in 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 changing the ticket. That being said, I have, I have to say I'm very impressed with her campaign. Look, are there things I have a problem with with her? Yes. Um, not talking to the press, obviously that's a problem for me. You got to be transparent. I'm, I'm, I I know why she's doing it, and I see why she's 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 fundraising as hell like like crazy. I get it. I still want to see more transparency. Um, but I will say, like her VP pick at Tim Walls, um, that was a home run for me. That's a grand slam, in fact. That's who I wanted to her to pick. It, for me, it was him or Mark Kelly. Or sorry, Tim Walls was somebody I was not terribly familiar with. I will, I will admit. For me, it was I would say my two were either Andy Bashir or Mark Kelly. But then as soon as I read about Tim Walls and saw one interview with him, I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I was if, mistaken. I was mistaken. I was just not familiar with the governor of Minnesota. Exactly. <laughs> and, 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 and look, and look, you're a Bernie guy. So if you're Bernie yeah. guy, you love Tim Walls. <laughs> That's yeah. right down the Bernie path. Right I, I want to just call him Uncle. I have an Uncle Tim, and so and he's a, he's a fun. He's a very fun uncle. And yeah. so I just want to like I don't even want to call him Governor Walls. I want to call him Uncle Tim. And I feel like if I asked him if I could, he would give me permission to do so, encourage yeah. me to do so, because he just seems like an incredibly likable, warm human. And what's clear is that the the, the enthusiasm gap has has, has definitely is, is, is almost even. The, now. the yes, yes. Now, when you talk about enthusiasm, you talk about like who brings in whom. Um, you know, kind of going back to the debate a little bit. Um, and and the issues, and more I guess than just the issues in general, where where Vice President Harris finds herself because she did release her official platform, by the way, I think yesterday or today. Okay, yeah, on, on, on a website. I was literally doom scrolling this morning while we were uh, waiting to do this, and I saw it. It was on, um, I forget, maybe The Hill or The Atlantic put an infographic together of slides, something like that. It was black and yellow. Um, but I'm sure it's going to be a, a, on a dozen different Instagram pages that we follow. So, well, But yeah, her official, her official like position or platform positions or whatever is out. But where I do have an issue, it's like she did a really, she made a really smart pick in Tim Walls. You know, obviously, I mean, we said it was all, all but guaranteed she was going to have to bring in like a swing, uh, a, a, somebody from a swing state, most likely a white man, because she was going to have too much racism and misogyny against her to, you know, if it was two black women, it would, it would give all the pearl clutchers strokes. You know what I mean? It's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah, of course. But I... where I have issue and where I think she's playing a dangerous game is that she's not taking a hard enough position. <clears throat> she is doing some really nice things on consumer protection. She is doing some active work, like not just campaigning on it, but actively doing things to bring down prices. Um, but I don't I think she's playing a dangerous game going for white moderates instead of the youth and print principally on the issues of um, Gaza and Israel yeah, and, that's the main issue, and, yeah. and corporate corruption right. and defense and like defense spending, you know, and I, think, I would I, say, I would say like the, the, the militarism goes hand in hand with the Gaza issue because our religion of military in this country is exactly what's feeding our refusal to put a stop to genocide. So here's a platform right here. I believe this is it hit right here. Cut tax to middle class families, make rent. This is a big one for me. Make rent more affordable and home ownership more attainable. That's humongous for me. Because that's one of the biggest issues of, of this inflation era. See, that's one I need to drill into. And that's one if I could ask the vice president, I would want some very specific and, and uncomfortable answers on. Because right. historically, establishment Democrats don't have a good track record of standing up to the real estate lobby, of standing up to the the, the rental, uh, you know, the, the landlord lobby, right. the banks, the private equity companies. Like, they they roll over for that. And I agree. So how are you going to bring down rent, Madam Vice President? Because you don't have a track record of doing much to bitch slap those people up and down the beltway. 
Right. That's well, uh, <clears throat> that would be your colleague, Senator Warren. Exactly. Uh, grow small business and invest in entrepreneurs. Uh, take on bad actors and bring down costs. Strengthen and bring down the cost of health care. That's another big one for me. Uh, protect and strengthen Social Security and Medicare. That's a huge one for me as well, too, as I'm in my mid-40s. Um, support American innovation and workers. Provide a pathway to middle class through quality, affordable education. Invest. And this is huge. Invest in affordable child care and long-term care. That's, again, the t- uh, Tim Wall's uh, pick right there. Um, yeah. Lower energy costs and tackle the climate crisis. And, of course, uh, they, they have uh, Trump's... Uh, Project 2025 agenda, um, and I would and I would say the same statement I just made about the real estate lobby also applies to the healthcare and insurance lobbies. Right, and of course they don't a- have mm-hmm. establishment Democrats don't have a good rec- track record on that since the Affordable Care Act. Right, of course the 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 social issue here, of course, was restore and protect protect freedoms and protect civil rights and freedoms as well. That's that's standard there. Yeah. Uh, but she, what what I really need the Democrats to do, and, and specifically Vice President Harris in her campaign, is, you know, this has to, it, like, you can't, we can't just keep putting patches on 60-year-old tires. The rubber is dried out, corroded, and falling off the fucking rim. I think, we need new, mm-hmm. like, we need new shit. So quit just putting little band-aids on bullet wounds well, that every time ta- every time you lose a fraction of a percent of your majority. I mean, you can some, argue some the reason Republican ripped yeah, it off. I agree 100 percent Which is and again, you can argue, and we, we, we for years we've talked about this too, also with that, that lane of, of, of populism, of course. That's what Donald Trump Donald Trump tapped into in 2016. Yeah. And in in, in for example, in the case of healthcare, like Medicare for all needs to be where we start. If that's not the if that's not what you're working like the bar is on the fucking floor right now for American healthcare and healthcare affordability and outcomes for American patients compared to other developed nations. So if it if it doesn't start with Medicare for all, like I don't even know what you're talking about. That, that which is why I'm so interested in the Tim Walls pick because Tim Walls represents all those things. Now this is why I'm wondering: if, is this is this the Democrats finally coming to terms that you know what? Because they they they've lost the numbers, and you can only continue to, to to drive home the abortion thing and drive home the Trump is bad thing so much. You know what I mean? My cynical concern is that it's placating the Bernie voter to get them into the booth in November, but then once. Once we're, you know, inaugurated and rolling, they're not going to have time for that. We're not going to want to spend that political capital right. this early in the administration. Well, I want to see the, I, well, and all right. the other bullshit answers they give when they sell out the left. And that's why I'm hoping like so like the Democrats do well to say in the House and the Senate. Let's say they get more seats in the Senate right now. They want one seat advantage. Yeah, I'll see get more. We'll see how this election goes. Um, I don't think their odds are very good on either of those fronts. By the way, to, I, to think gain, to gain I think they're going to win. I think they're going to win the presidency, and I don't think they're going to like. I don't know. I'm, I was, I'm not confident. I haven't, I haven't followed the uh, the house race. Uh, the house race is uh, um, it, uh, polling. Yeah. If we wake up on November eighth or whatever the hell Wednesday is, and there's yeah. a like four or five seat majority in the Senate for Democrats, I would be pretty shocked. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I think it might actually go the other way. I think so. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's possible. I mean, this this election can change all that too, also, because some of the rhetoric you're hearing now, it's I think people are starting to get I, I do I do think Trump's god awful debate performance the other night is going to harm people down ballot because now you have people But that's what I'm saying. That like you're gonna have a whole bunch of candidates that are not wanting that man to campaign for them because they don't want to get tagged with some viral ridiculous thing he says if he uses the R slur and calls somebody the N word without thinking about it on national television and now your campaign's got that fucking right. strap to it. Especially if you know that this is definitely his last chance to get in office because there's no way in hell you're running again in four years. <sighs> not unless they find a way to. Elon Musk like puts a Tesla battery into his ass or something. I don't know. Like, I mean, the guy, the guy is. The man is it. seventy-eight years old. Looks, it sounds, and from all accounts of people around him, smells like he's well, like more than on death's door. Still finds a way to stay alive, man. <laughs> Still finds a way. Like when you That's look crazy. at close-up pictures of his skin. Yeah. 
It is weird. It doesn't look like skin. I don't even know what to call it. Yeah. <sighs> and I think there's a lot of, I, I, there's a lot of good thing I haven't had breakfast yet. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and there's, there's a lot of Republicans, I think, also, too, that uh, I, I think want him gone. They're not going to say that publicly because they don't want to get, like, you know, lambasted by MAGA himself. But there's, sure. uh, there's, there's Republicans behind, behind I mean, J.D. Vance is the fascist they want. That's why he's on the ticket. Right. They're like, they're, I imagine they're counting on President Trump having a high probability of not completing his term, given his age and what I imagine are undisclosed health conditions. Um, and yeah, J.D. Vance is the fascist they want. Are he you does saying whatever, that he does saying, whatever he's told by the Federalist Society? Are you, are, and he are at you, least, like can fill out a form. Are you saying Donald Trump is now Joe Biden? Hasn't he been for some time? <laughs> Not, I, I'll say Biden's a little more extreme because Biden has showed. Biden showed. Well, yeah, I mean the the like the swing on President Biden is a little more extreme because you know he was a competent and rational person prior to <laughs> prior uh, oh, to very right. recent, uh, you know, until right. very recently. Right. Donald Trump was an in, was like he's been spouting incomprehensible bollocks for quite some time. It's funny. I'm, I'm watching. I'm watching the debate on on Tuesday. I'm like, for the first time ever. I, I, I always know Donald Trump was older, up late seventies. I always knew that, but for the first time, I was like saying to myself, "Like, wow, he looks old." He looked like a feeble old man. Like, yeah, and, I, and I've never said that about him before. Even in June, I didn't say that about him against Joe Biden. Yeah, because the contrast there with Joe is, Biden and him is different. And there is one little thing when you talk about sort of like the the, the sound and smell and and look of things. Um, Vice President Harris has this tick, and I noticed it when. I don't want to call it a tick. It's just a tendency, I guess. Um, I noticed it when she was, you know, during the 2020 primaries. Mm -hmm. And I've even seen it in Senate hearings. And then I saw it again on on uh, Tuesday. And I was, um, I was like, or Monday, whatever it was. I was Tuesday, texting with, a, oh, it was Tuesday. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was texting with like one of my group chats. And I was like, okay, am I noticing this? Are you guys seeing this? And they're like, oh yeah, she does this. So what it is, when she's very upset or when she looks like she wants to call somebody a really bad name, yeah. she sometimes has this tendency to let her voice shake, almost quiver. It like, it kind of happens in her throat. Like, and it sounds like she's fighting back a scream. If like to people who, you know, know anything about her tendencies and the way she reportedly talks in private. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like I, I assume she's holding back the urge to call him an insane, racist, misogynist, homophobic motherfucker to his face on national television. However, <laughs> it makes her sound intimidated. It's the kind of thing that to idiots and assholes and misogynists and people who love the Joe Rogan experience and stuff like that are going to go, did you hear that? President Trump had her literally quivering on stage. She couldn't even like get her words out. She was shaking so bad. It's like that dude is so she crazy. wasn't shaking because she was scared. She's shaking because she's pissed off. That dude is Those so... are two different things. Yeah, Th that dude. But is... nevertheless, yeah. it plays that way to idiots. Yeah. I'll I'll touch on that in a second. Audience can't sure with Joe Rogan because it'll fit into one of the segments we're going to talk about in a second. But here here's some highlights from the uh, from the debate um, from uh, Tuesday night. Uh, we'll stop and we'll stop and go throughout the, uh, these, these highlights and re react to it. They didn't okay. fire any of their economists. They have the same people. That's a good way not to have books written about you. Donald Trump was fired by 81 million people. So let's be clear about that. And clearly, he is having a very difficult time processing that. On Tuesday, why can't he get off the fucking election election denial thing? It's Sam Frings' campaign. For the same reason that since the 80s, if you've ever said anything he didn't like or agree with, he would bust out a Sharpie and cut clippings out of newspapers and send them to you proving the point. Like, for example, you know, when somebody said he had tiny hands, you know, the reporter who you know, will say it was Maggie Haberman just because that's the you know, White House reporter, I can think of whatever. Maggie Mag Haberman Mag 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 reported Hagerman, that, Hagerman, he called, he called yeah, her? Well, well, yeah, whatever. something like that. But okay, yeah. I'm just making all of this up. It's all just for the purposes of the hypothetical. But of like, course, yeah. Maggie Haberman says Trump has tiny hands. And then for the next 25 years, that man would cut pictures out of newspapers of his hands and circle them and go, see, very nice, very normal hands. And then like mail them to you. He's famous for doing that He's for sad. years, yes. decades. Yep. So 
he's going to let losing an election go? No. No. All right, Stop. let's continue. Yeah. <laughs> Day, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump squared off in the second 2024 presidential debate on ABC. They shook hands and had a respectful dialogue about the challenges facing us today. She hates Israel. What you think is a friendship with what is known to be a dictator who would eat you for lunch. You remember that first debate a million years ago with Joe Biden? Trump sure does. And I don't he like can't this, get the man out of his mind. I don't like this one. I want to try another uh, another highlight. This is not good. Yeah. Like she doesn't Do you, have is a yours. She's is that yours that's sped up or is that just her that's, like that's me? I, I'll, I'll slow it down. That's me. I slow it down. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I just wasn't too, sure if that was her or you. Is it too fast? No, 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 no. Not too fast. I just was like, I was like, did somebody actually post a video like that? <laughs> Biden's plan. And it's like four sentences, like run spot run. Four sentences <laughs> that it just, oh, we'll try and lower taxes. She doesn't have a plan. Take a look at her plan. She doesn't have a plan. I believe in she does now. <laughs> she does now. <laughs> she and does have a plan now. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. At the very least, repeal your tax plan that has absolutely gutted the middle class and working class uh working class and all but uh, all but eliminated taxes for corporations and billionaires. So I right there. I'd say that's that would be the first page of my plan. And then the second page of my plan is to beat the piss out of all the people you've been giving tax breaks to for the last seven years. Agreed. And the ambition, the aspirations, the dreams of the American people. And that is why I imagine and have actually a plan to build what I call an opportunity economy. Because here's the thing. We know that we have a, a shortage of, of homes and housing. And the cost of housing is too expensive for far too many people. Platform. We know that young what, what economy? What what is That's, it? I was just gonna say the opportunity economy is gonna be something we see. That's funny. I guarantee what we funny. dig into that plan. It's funny because like in 2020 for Trump, opportunity zones was one of the things he kept using in the black community. Opportunity zones. That was, that was opportunity word. zones for landlords yeah. to come in and eliminate black businesses and take black dollars, but not actually give people black right, uh, black right. people equity exactly. in anything. Right. That's your That's opportunity a... zone, right, Mr. President? That was, what <laughs> I that was what I thought. Okay, let's let's move on. <laughs> we know that we have a, a shortage of, of homes and housing and the cost of housing is too expensive for far too many people. We know that young families need support to raise their children. And I intend on extending a tax cut for those families of six thousand dollars, which is the largest child tax credit that we have given in a long time. My opponent, on the other hand, Goodness. his plan is to do what he has done before, which is to provide a tax cut for billionaires and big corporations, well, which done. will result in five trillion dollars to America's deficit. We're doing tariffs on other countries. Other countries are going to finally after. I'm so tired of years the tariff thing. Oh, my road. God. You what, can what you cut that right there. Yeah. He just keeps saying tariff, 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 tariff. And literally the moderator had to correct him and say, mm, no, Mr. President, all indicators are that tariffs cause uh, uh, the tariffs cause consumer prices to rise like that those those impacts get passed along to the consumer they don't change trade policy right yep yep all that we've done for the world uh, look we've had a terrible economy because inflation has which is really known as a country buster it breaks up countries we have uh, inflation right like very too. few people no, no, oh my no, god no, seen before. No, go ahead, he look. keeps he, how, I, I need a counter for how many times he said inflation during the debate. Um, I'm so sick of this. It's not fucking inflation. It is an increase in the consumer price index driven simply by corporations producing every good and service we touch arbitrarily raising their prices. And now reports are starting to come out on this. And it's demonstrating that companies like Target, CVS, Walgreens, Safeway, uh, Kroger, across the board, raising their prices with reckless abandon and bald-faced lying to us about why they're doing it and their ability to not do it for the last five years, coupled with they're locking everything behind plexiglass and making you contact a team member to come get you a tube of toothpaste while simultaneously understaffing your stores so that you can save on labor expense has led to right. a situation where American retailers, I think, have seen like a 20% decline in sales against uh, online retailers. Mm. And now they're suddenly going, oh, we need to lower our prices to get you back in our stores. No shit. Did you ever think that the reason people are stealing from you is because they can't afford to buy 
a carton of eggs for fourteen ninety five, and they can't afford to buy a bag of spinach for eight ninety five, and then a this. gallon of milk that. is seven dollars. You know, whatever. Like, it's insane. It it's isn't insane. I'm just saying a lot of the crime that you see now is because desperation, not because they want to do crime. It's desperation. Mm-hmm. So also over the last five years, one of the interesting bellwethers of this has been fast food pricing. For example, over the last five years, inflationary conditions would explain a roughly 30% increase in pricing at the drive-thru. The only major American fast food retailer who is in line with that curve is Starbucks. They're at about a 32 or 34% pricing increase over the last five years. So they've trended with market conditions. Right. They are the only one who has done so. Right. It starts with like Subway. Subway's at like 40, 44%. But then it starts getting crazy once you get up to like, um, I want to say KFC has gone up like 56%. But then the really bad ones are Chipotle, Mm -hmm. Taco Bell, Popeyes, and McDonald's. Uh, Chipotle went up 56%. Taco Bell went up like 81% or 77%, something like that. Uh, Popeye's went up 86%. Wow. And McDonald's 100%. Thank God I don't eat those. McDonald's has doubled their prices in five years. Yep. It's crazy, right? It's insane. For so probably the worst. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah. So I was just saying, it's like all these different things you're talking about. It. This isn't inflation. This is corporations. It's price, it's price gouging. Less. Yeah, corporations are paying their workers us less than they've ever paid us, and then they are charging us more than they've ever charged us relativistically for the same goods and services. So and yet I'm paid. and yet I'm supposed to vote against a minimum wage increase. Get the fuck out of here. Bro. Yeah, and Seriously. nine like the what is it the 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 loss of wealth by the lower 90% is up to like 8 trillion dollars or something like that since the pandemic. That's insane. And or 6 trillion something along it's it it is no, 8 trillion is a different number. Sorry, I got that mixed up with something we're going to talk about in a minute. Uh, no, I want to say it's like five and a half or six trillion that the the American worker has lost and that the working and poor and middle class have lost over the last five years. And like 80 or 90 percent of it goes to the top, uh, you know, the, the richest people in the world. It's insane. Or is this insane. And then they're not taxed on it. No. And that's the worst part. Not taxed on either. Yeah. Fucking crazy. Worst in our nation's history. We were at 21%, but that's being generous because many things are 50, 60, 70, and 80% higher than they were just a few years ago. About. They have, nope. and she has He's just throwing numbers out there. I mean, he's probably he correct, but he's just throwing numbers and saying things. That's like, okay, what's up 20%? What's up 50%? I just said, yes, McDonald's has raised their prices 100%. You know, Chipotle has raised their prices 56%. But that's what he does. He floods the zone. He floods he, the zone. Yeah. He doesn't, and this is what I mean when I went, and I mean, he's been, he was much better at this eight oh, years God, ago. Oh, God, 2016, yeah. He could flood the zone with things that actually sounded like talking points, but now he's just, it's just word salad. Well, word salad and dogs being eaten, but we'll get there later. Country oh. with policy that's insane. Almost policy that you'd say they have to hate our country. First of all, they bought their chips from Taiwan. We hardly make chips anymore Taiwan. because of... Uh, philosophies like they have and policies like they have. I don't say her because she has no policy. Everything that she believed three years ago and four years ago is out the window. She's going to my philosophy. Union labor. Because we have minimum wages and union labor. That's why we don't manufacture as many chips in the United States. We don't pay people three cents a day and, you know, round them up in fields to come work in factories. Exactly. I mean, that's not to say we don't do our own share of human rights atrocities, but that's, you know, we don't have factories. We don't have too many factories where, or at least not in the same kind of numbers that they do in other countries. Otherwise, outsourcing wouldn't. Yes, we do have sweatshops. We do have child labor. We have a number of abhorrent labor conditions taking place in this country. I'm not fucking stupid. Right. But there's a reason it gets outsourced to India, Bangladesh, China, you know, Malaysia. It's because they make three dollars a day. Boy, look at look at Kamala's uh, facial expressions in these next couple of seconds here. Fina, in fact, oh, I yeah. oh, yeah, this hat. she's gone to my philosophy. But if she ever got elected, she'd change it, and it will be the end of our country. She's a Marxist. Everybody knows she's a Marxist. Her father's a Marxist professor in economics, and he taught her well. 
But when you look at what she's done to our country, and when you look at these millions and millions of people that are pouring into our country monthly, where it's, I believe, 21 million people, not the 15 that people say, and I think it's a lot higher than the 21, that's bigger than New York State pouring in. And just look at what they're doing to our country. They're criminals. Many of these people coming in are criminals. Okay. And that's bad for our economy, too. You know, you mentioned before, we'll talk about immigration later. Well, bad immigration is the worst thing that can happen to our economy. All right. They have the, hold right. up. Yeah, go ahead. Hold go ahead. up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the, you know, it's the bouncing between all the different things, calling her a communist or daddy's a communist. And then all of a sudden now we're talking about immigrants flooding the border. All right, let's break a couple of things down. Number one, she's not okay. a Marxist. Calling a centrist a Marxist is insulting to people who are actually Marxists because she couldn't carry a Marxist sweaty gym bag. She doesn't have the policy positions. And like has happened in many times throughout history, she finds herself in a contingent of quote unquote liberals who would sell out the far left for a cookie. Um, well, we're talking about cookies, I mean, it's pretty good cookies, though. Well, I mean, it depends. I mean, are we yeah. talking about Levain? Are we talking about Crumble? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, Crumble's crap. Uh, <laughs> Crumble's crap. <laughs> um, insomnia cookies are good, though. Um, I like, I like the, Oh, okay. Um, no, but the immigration thing. I've talked about this numerous times about our policies on ref you know going back to title 42 on refugees asylum seekers and what have you our economy is actively leaving gdp on the table to the tune of about eight billion dollars a year the last time i looked by not admitting more immigrants from particularly the global south because we have a tremendous labor shortage in this country at the lower at, at the the lower skill and wage tiers of the workforce the reason for that is many fold but the most the most prominent reason as to for example why employees are you, you know having an exodus from the service industry pay benefits pto that simple mm. pay people a living wage Give them health care, let them take at least two to four weeks of vacation a year and stop putting them in cages at the border. And you will see our economy grow at the three, three and a half percent they claim that their shit can do, you know, that 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 would happen. But, you know, right now we are admitting fewer refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants from the global south than we have in 10 years. And it is negatively impacting our economy. It's, it's all it's period. All, end of sentence. It's all it, 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 because all fear mongering. It really is. It really is. Yeah. It's. I mean, the whole thing. It's. Oh, she's a communist. Oh, she's gonna let the rapists and killers in. Oh, this. Oh, that. It's the same victim grievance fear mongering crap. And if your message is fear and opposition, not leadership and inspiration, you're just an asshole. I agree. 100%. All right, let's continue. And a dangerous she has one is that. destroyed mm -hmm. our country with policy that's insane. Almost policy that you'd say they have to hate our country. Well, as I said, okay, I Mr. President. Um how did how did she just how did she destroy our economy? She's not the president. Exactly. Well, again, people she's, people she's provided all, she's presided over exactly what two votes in four years. And to votes. be fair, and to be fair, also too, the, the, the I, I keep telling people this all the time. The role of vice president, honestly, is the most overrated role in the history of politics. Like so, they literally well, what, wasn't it uh was uh, it's a line in the West Wing. There's a Leo uh Leo right. is talking to Josh and he says something about it being like a gilded prison or something like that, or yeah. uh like the 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 most prestigious emeritus position, something like that. But yeah, basically, you're, you're, you're basically a bitch boy. You're basically a bitch boy. Yeah, you're sitting there in case in case your boss dies. Like watch Veep. Like yeah, I know it's comedy and all, but Veep is a, is a pretty much a, a pretty accurate but, but, yeah. but satire, but, but accurate description of what, what the vice president role really is. And how they don't you do get anything. from how you get from Hoynes to Barry Hill to Bingo Bob. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that. we'll get to all that. We'll get yep, to that. Okay. So now on, on, on the abortion issue, why should women trust Trump on the issue of abortion? Here we go. And that's not actually a surprising fact. Let's understand how we got here. Donald Trump 
hand-selected three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would undo the protections of Roe v. Wade. And they did exactly as he intended. And now in over 20 states, there are Trump abortion bans, which make it criminal for a doctor or nurse to provide health care. In one state, it provides prison for life. Trump abortion bans that make no exception even for rape and incest, which understand what that means. A survivor of a crime of violation to their body does not have the right to make a decision about what happens to their body next. That is immoral. And he looks one like does not he have doesn't to imagine understand their the actual or words deeply held she's beliefs using. to agree. Nope. The government, not all, and not Donald all. Trump certainly like, should look not at be that telling face. A, I know. That is not the face of a man who's processing anything. He's the just women waiting for his turn to shout. I you agree. want to talk about this? Is what people wanted? Pregnant women who want to carry <coughs> pregnancy to term, it? suffering from a miscarriage, being denied care in an emergency room because the healthcare providers are afraid they might go to jail. This is and when she's her voice stopped shaking, by the way, this is when she actually she didn't got pissed that. off. Her husband. This, this is the issue where she took, really, really took off of her. This is really yeah, really no, this is this is exactly where I was. I think you I can't remember if I was texting you or if it was the group chat, but I literally said she lost the quiver and she she locked in now. She now she's spitting fire because this is the issue it's that, like if she actually leans into it and like gets pissed off and shouts at him, she sounds better. Like, yeah, absolutely. You didn't want that. She's yeah. doing what I want her to do, which is like, you're so full of shit. Yeah, exactly. And you, you can see his reaction. Like, what, what, how am I going to fucking want to counter this? Like, abortion is going to kill. Abortion is going to. He looks, it, he looks like a child getting yelled at by a teacher when he's like fully caught and can't yeah. do anything about it. And he's just trying to like sit there and not make eye contact. But you kind of have to make eye if, contact every right. once in a while. Can't say anything because she got you dead to rights. Like, if she wins this election, for example, um, this is the issue that, that that helps her and hurts him. This is the issue. Without question. Well, yeah, because I think this is the issue that has people who will even report to pollsters that they're voting for Trump holding their nose and voting for her in private because even if they're conservative, like, they can't rock with the Rose stuff. And I, th I think that's ultimately what's what's going to probably be the 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 major like linchpin issue of this election because as we're seeing in real time mm -hmm. um the like the federalist is because so all right hold on this is another like little west wing tie-in but like that show came out in 1999 and ended in 2007 and the federalist society was trying to shove judges through the door who would overturn roe like that was a talking point in the West Wing in like 2003. Yeah. Yep. Like Absolutely. this is not new. This has always been the plan. And it's like, um, I, I, I think she, I think she killed it on this issue. Um, I think this issue will win her the election. Um, but I'm just so sick and tired of all the nonsense. And then because I did mention the Federalist Society, the way he tries to distance himself from Project 2025 is honestly comical. Yeah all survivor of incest being forced to carry a pregnancy to term they don't want that if you want to really know the inside track on who the former president is if he didn't make it clear already just ask people who have worked with him his former chief of staff a four-star general has said he has contempt for the constitution of the united states his former national security advisor has said he is dangerous yes, and yes i do his former secretary of Defense <laughs> i am dangerous said the nation the republic would never survive another trump term See, I'm a different kind of a person. I fired most of those people. Not so graciously. They did bad things or a bad job. I fired them. They never fired one person. They didn't fire anybody having to do with Afghanistan and the Taliban and the 13 people who's, who's were just killed, viciously and violently killed. And I got to know the parents and the family. They didn't fire. They should what have fired all those about? generals. Pause that general's up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do, do you actually know what he's talking about? No. It's all bullshit. The 13 people, like, we haven't been in Afghanistan in three years. What the fuck are we talking about? Like, exactly. uh huh? Yeah, he got flustered. He got flustered because he knows he's, he's being called out. See, Joe Biden. But, yeah, but this is Probably what I could. mean. And I'm kind of doing, I'm, I'm almost doing a little bit of shtick with this because it's like, how do people watch this and go, that guy knows what the fuck he's talking because about? Because they vote on fucking vibes. That's why. I mean, I know. I yes. I, I mean, I'm asking semi rhetorically, but I'm like, you, and, and honestly, I want to sit there. I I literally w wish I could like walk around with this video to my neighbors here because I see way too many Trump flags and shit, and go. Did you, did you actually hear what he said, or did you just hear Jesse Waters talk about what he said? Because if you tell me what that means, explain it to me, Trump they supporter. Heard, they heard. Charlie what is Trump. what what argument did he just make? No, they heard I, Charlie Brown's teachers. They heard. Yeah, like I'll wait. 
I'll wait. Yeah. Like, no, it's, it's you ridiculous. Didn't say anything. <clears throat> didn't say anything. Yeah, exactly. All right. Continue. People, because that was one of the most incompetently handled situations anybody has ever seen. So when somebody does a bad job, I fire him. This is someone who has openly said he would terminate, I'm quoting, terminate the Constitution of the United States, that he would weaponize the Department. I don't know why I shake his head there. He did say that. He tweeted that. It's, it's all for the world to see. And this, and this right here for me, when people ask me, and uh, I know there's, a lot, there's a lot of people on social media, in my own family, who are, who've been getting down on me the last couple of weeks about like, you know, you know, you're kind of soft on Trump these days and all this stuff. And I keep telling them, I don't know why you think that. I, I have never voted for Donald Trump. I will never vote for Donald Trump. Even if I was still a Republican, I would vote for Donald Trump because of principles. Like, just yeah, that right there alone. All we can say, if you don't get it, if like you can watch this and still go, he knows what he's doing. That's yeah. the guy. I, that's the guy we need. I, no. I don't need to have a conversation with you. You're you're beyond help. Right. And the thing is, too, also, like, even if I was a Republican and I love, I love the policies, for example, I could I still can vote for him because uh, just on principle, you try to stop the Constitution. That's the, to me, that's disqualifying right there. Also, this this will tie into something we're going to do in a little bit. But yeah. like, let's be clear. Four presidents, including you, sir, presided over the war in Afghanistan. Yeah. One finished. Like, time. and two of those guys did it for eight years at a time. Afghanistan was everyone's fault, including us, you and me. Like, Afghanistan and Iraq are every single American's fault that was alive at that time and over the age of 18. Yep. If you were a lot, if you were 18 or older in 2002, we all bear responsibility in Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And all the other damage, you know, peripheral to that. I, I don't, we were I don't, all foaming at the mouth on September 12th. We were. Yep. But there are reasons for it. Anyway, go on. Yeah, I, I don't. We'll get, we'll get to that. Absolutely. Yeah of justice against his political enemies. Someone who has openly expressed disdain for members of our military. Understand what it would mean if Donald Trump were back in the White House with no guardrails. I probably took a bullet to the head because of the things that they say about me. They talk about democracy. I'm a threat to democracy. They're the threat to democracy with a fake Trump. Russia. Ru you do understand that a, a Republican shot you. And you took a shard of glass to your ear. If you got well, shot, well, no, 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 you no. would it look like that? He still got shot, he still got shot at, though. Let's be okay, real. Maybe, I don't, yeah, don't want to downgrade that. Yeah, though, but. He, okay, he got shot at. But like, my only uh, thing is this, though. What, my only thing is this, though. And I'm not even defending here, but your, your rhetoric, you have to know what your rhetoric stands for and what your rhetoric created. Okay? That part. You're polarizing. You didn't think that part. So, yeah, you're not going to piss people off the way you talk and the way you act and the way you the things you say. Every think tank, uh, foundation, nonprofit that does research on like violence, extremism, yeah, the connection between political statements and political violence, that stuff has all been sharply on the rise since. 2008 and was ramped up even more since 2016 by that fat orange piece of shit we see on the left and it's pretty much universally understood donald trump's rallies have made americans less safe and they have the made thing, so mass shootings right. more likely to take place they have why... made acts of political violence more likely to take place. And again, it was not the left. It was not Antifa who rallied tens of thousands of people to the steps of the Capitol, kicked in the fucking doors, and tried to lynch members of Congress. Yeah. And was... the thing is, also, it isn't who's like, I can't stand Ted Cruz. Forget his policies and politics and all that. This dude. And his, his face. And... His well, face. that dude. Not, yeah. This dude, on the left right here, this dude on the left here insulted Ted Cruz's wife and and father. You know, um, first off, said, I think he's great. Knowing that, knowing that, I don't care that he calls my wife. I don't. Let I, I, I me be clear about this. I don't give a fuck who you are. If you talk shit about my wife, I'm fucking you up on site. I don't give a fuck if you're president of the United States. End of discussion. Principles matter to I, me. 
well, you have to have a spine to, you know, to understand that line of thinking. So anyway, back to the uh, debate. Russia, Russia, Russia investigation Russia, Russia, Russia. went nowhere. We will. Well, I think this is so rich <laughs> coming from someone who has been prosecuted for national security crimes, economic crimes, election interference, has been found liable for sexual assault, and his next big court appearance is in November at his own criminal sentence. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. This would have never happened. I will get that settled and fast, and I'll get the war with Ukraine and Russia ended. If I'm president-elect, I'll get it done before even becoming president. Vice and president stop. Harris, he says you hate yeah, Israel. That, 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 bullshit. That's bullshit. Let's You're not be going to. clear. If he ends the war with Ukraine, it's because it's it it will be because he's empowered Putin to conquer Ukraine. Donald Trump has always been a fanboy of Vladimir Putin and in all likelihood is indirectly bankrolled by him. Hmm. Yes. So like I <laughs> to people that uh, there's still people <laughs> there's still people that drive up and down my street and honk at the guy with Trump flags in his stupid because truck. they have no problem. I hate the libs. I hate Democrats. Which, uh, uh, wait, wait, I can understand you hate the Democratic Party. I totally understand that. There's a lot of shit the party I can't stand. But use logic first. Yeah. Okay. Like basic understanding of objective fact. Right. That's absolutely not true. I have my entire career and life supported Israel and the Israeli people. He knows that he's trying to, again, divide and, and distract from the reality, which is it is very well known that Donald Trump is weak and wrong on national security and foreign policy. It is well known that he admires dictators, wants to be a dictator on day one, according to himself. It is well known that he said of Putin that he can do whatever the hell he wants and go into Ukraine. It is well known that he said when Russia went into Ukraine, it was brilliant. It is well known he exchanged love letters with Kim Jong-un. And it is absolutely well known that these dictators and autocrats are rooting for you to be president again because they're so clear. They can manipulate you with flattery and favors. And that is why so many military leaders who you have worked with have told me you are a disgrace. That is why. We understand that we have to have a president who is not consistently weak and wrong on national Harris. security, including the importance of upholding. All right, I'm going to join Lindsey Davis in asking for a pause here. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's also be clear on the we'll get to her statements on Gaza and whatnot and her position on Gaza and Israel. Um, but make no mistake. Yeah. Oh, hold on, I think I lost you. Thank Sorry, you, I, I had a I had a it's call okay. come in. Um, okay. No, uh, if on the issue of Gaza specifically, if President Trump was presiding over that relationship, the dip, our diplomatic involvement in that conflict, he would have empowered Benjamin Netanyahu to simply just level Gaza, like carpet bomb Gaza, probably the West Bank too. Because that's what he that's what he supports. He, he he's far worse. He's far worse an issue than 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 the, the than Biden is, and, and Biden's not that great on it either, for the record. No, he, no, he uh, no. Both both President Biden and Vice President Harris have abhorrent positions on Gaza. Let's be I agree. Like, I agree really really clear. This is why I don't We're up to a point who... where something like sixty eight or seventy percent of Americans support ending uh, the sending of weapons to Israel. Yeah. Um. So Republicans, you know. We need a two-state solution, prosecution of war crimes, and an embargo on arms to Israel. It's as simple as that. War crimes, genocide, ethnic cleansing. That's what's happening right now. American citizens are being killed by American weapons wielded by the IDF. Thousands of children have died. Every school has been destroyed. Every university has been destroyed. Every hospital has been destroyed. Basic services of food, water, access to air. Um, all of these things were in peril in Gaza prior to October 7th, 2023. And 
It, it's worse now. It's a genocide. I mean, it makes the Warsaw Ghetto look like fucking Disneyland. Yeah. All right. So last last minute here of this uh, debate here. Last and minute. one really quick. She yeah, did. She did use a widely disproven assertion in defense of Israel, talking about the mass rapes that took place by Hamas fighters and blah, 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 while making no mention of the widely reported, self-reported sexual assaults and crimes that IDF members have been committing on dozens. But as I tell you, the Gaza issue is so complicated because no one's writing the issue. Um, and, you know, it's one of those well, things. Well, I, I will, I will, offer you this it's actually not that complicated in this moment because in this moment a genocide is taking place and regardless of who is being ethnically cleansed that must stop regardless of who you believe those people's representatives are that must stop yeah. bombing homes killing children blowing babies to bits that must stop immediately right benjamin netanyahu has never been a good faith actor on the notion of a two-state solution Palestinians have not had any kind of effective representation that that resembles a government or a diplomatic corps since 2006. There's not been an election. They like Palestinians don't have the ability hardly to communicate with one another in the West Bank and Gaza. So like how can you say in any way shape or form that Palestinian people are being even remotely meaningfully represented? They're not. Right. They're being controlled in a state of apartheid and and uh, occupation. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's get the last minute here of this uh, debate. In the highest regard, our military. Vice President Harris, thank you. They're the ones, and she's the one that caused it. That's weak on national security by allowing caused every what? nation last month for the year a hundred and. Caused it. Caused what? She's the one who caused it. Caused what? National security. Is it yeah. National security. I Hold just. It. He's not talking about anything. He just says things. He just says things. What, 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 what war are country. we currently in, Mr. Down. President, that she caused? He endorsed like, her last week. said, I hope she wins. And I think he meant it because what he's gotten away with is absolutely incredible. It wouldn't have happened with me. The leaders of other countries think that they're weak and incompetent, and they are. They're grossly incompetent. And I just ask one question. Why does Biden go in and kill the Keystone Pipeline and approve the single biggest deal that Russia's ever made, Nord Stream 2, the biggest pipeline anywhere in the world going to Germany and all over Europe? Because they're weak and they're ineffective. All right. So, uh, maybe yeah. because the Keystone XL pipeline is a fucking disaster environmentally and in terms of indigenous rights and sovereignty and the stacks of treaties we've already shit upon for the last 160 years. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe because of that. Maybe. <sighs> uh, this dude is this. He's hysterical. He really is. Oh, I'm trying yeah. to find, yeah. Let me ask you a question. Um. But so, Kamala obviously won the debate. That's not even a conversation. Anybody I mean, shit. Brett right? Hume was saying it, dude. Every every you know you know what's bad when like uh um basically everyone but saying, Hannity and Jesse Waters was willing to Jesse agree a clown. that Jesse Waters huh? a clown. Jesse Waters a clown oh, anyway. Yeah, they all are. He, he, There's only one good employee at Fox News, and it's that Jessica woman with the glasses, the, the dark haired lady that regularly dog walks her her fellow panelists. Yeah, I, I I can't think of her last name at the moment, um, but I love her because she's the only person that actually speaks anything resembling a fact on Fox News. Yeah. Um, so do you think this performance will reflect well on the polls? <sighs> yes, I don't think the polls are reflective of the race. Explain. So. I think she'll get a bump, but I don't think the polls are accurately going to capture um, what the electorate is doing. Um, there's that guy who's like predicted the last six presidential elections now, directly. Me, more, more eight. He, no, ten, that's ten. That's ten, and he's he, uh, got his. He actually, he's got uh, like all of his elements of like why and how and everything, and polling doesn't have fuck all to do with it or something. We, we actually, that, we know. actually, uh, we actually covered that on this podcast about two, three episodes ago, actually. Yeah, 
I could I, I couldn't um I, I did catch part of that and I'm just blanking on some of the specifics yeah. because short term memory is weird like that. It's okay. Um <laughs> no worries, bro. Uh, but yeah, the point that I, I do think the energy is going in the right direction. I do think Kamala Harris is playing a dangerous game, not taking a more firm position on Gaza that is reflective of the electorate, particularly the electorate under forty five. But she has said, though, she wants to say solution, didn't she? Has she said that? She's waffled on it. She has said she has used the words two state solution and, and expressed something that sounded like support for it. But it's, you know, tissue strong. Mm. There hasn't been a, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, bring down that wall. Mr. B, Mr. Netanyahu, tear down right. those fences like that, that's what yeah. we need. You know, cut yeah. off their allowance, cut off their arms, not their arms, their armaments. Uh, right. cut not off, not, not the, literally. It's a freaking well, I mean, <laughs> At this point, at this point, you know, maybe, maybe that's deserved after what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and his security. Well, oh, that guy's dangerous. Fuck anyway, so. He's yeah. yeah, and and I mean, at this point, the Israeli leadership is out of step with their own electorate. They are like. Zionists are going, guys, this is a bit much, you know, and I think that Vice President Harris is playing a dangerous game, pandering to white moderates and older people than speaking firmly to the issues that matter most to young people, because the under 40 part of the electorate is the biggest part of the electorate and the part that you need. And if they turn out, you will win. Now, you because did young see, people are not breaking for Trump. Right. Now, you did see, though, um, an hour after the debate was over that uh, one Taylor Swift did endorse uh, Mrs. Kamala Harris for president. Um, I hate so much that this is that this is a thing. But it is. That, it, it, that it, well, it matters. But fuck, it does. It does. Let me uh, read this a little bit with her, uh, her, uh, her, 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 her thing here. She goes, like, many of you uh, watch debate tonight. If you're ready, now it's a great time to do your research on issues at hand and stances that these candidates take on the topics that matter to you most. As a voter, I make sure to watch read everything I can about the proposed policies and plans for the country. Recently, this is the big part here now. But people are not talking about this more, uh, more, more about this. <clears throat> Recently, I was made aware that AI of me, artificial intelligence, falsely endorsing Donald Trump's presidential run was posted on the site. It really can up my fears around AI and dangers of spreading misinformation. It brought me to the conclusion that I need to be very transparent about my actual plans for this election to voter. The simplest way to combat misinformation is with the truth. I'll be cast my vote for my no, sorry. <clears throat> I'll be cast my vote for Kamala Harris and Tim Walls in the in the election. I'm going for Harris because she fights for the rights and causes I believe in I believe need a warrior to champion them. I think she's a steady handed, steady handed, gifted war, gifted, sorry, steady handed gifted leader and i believe we can accomplish so much more in this country if we are led by calm and not chaos i was so hard stop you for... really quick yeah, i go, just go. have to tell you mm -hmm. when you corrected yourself on steady handed my audio cut for a second and it sounded like you said stubby handed and i stubby. Had, to, <laughs> I had to like fight back a giggle anyway right i was so hard and impressed by her selection of running mate tim walls who has been standing for the lbg lgbtq plus rights ivf and a woman rights to her own body in decade and uh, her own body for decades I've done my research. I made my choice. Your research is all yours to do, and the choice is yours to make. I will also want to say, especially for first-time voters, remember that in order to vote, you have to be registered. I also find it's much easier to vote early. And, of course, the link, all that, with love and hope, uh, Taylor Swift, Chalice Cat Lady. Um, yeah, it shouldn't be a thing, obviously. Like, celebrities should do something. You know what's funny? This, this, this is what I, I, I get, you know, like, frustrated. Like, Trump supporters all pissed about this shit. If, if Taylor Swift endorsed Donald Trump, you motherfuckers be we going through the fucking roof. Like, stop. You're only mad because the person is not is not endorsing your guy. It's like you you tell you it's like you tell celebrities don't stick with sports. But you have a problem with Kid Rock? You got a problem with uh I don't know, give me Ted Scott Nugent? Mayo? Ted Nugent? Doesn't bother you. Dennis Quaid. The same. No. Clint Eastwood? Yeah. No, no one's them up. I'm not them up. They have every right to speak to speak to anyone. You, you're just big mad that your guy or your girl is not voting the way you wanted to, and that's not how life yeah. works, guys. I had to break it to you. Yeah, I just like I said, I can't like Taylor Swift is a talented person, and I'm not going to sit here and like antagonize Swifties. So you're not a Swiftie, like, are you? You're not a Swiftie, are you? 
I'm not. I will sing along to songs in the car when Me white too. friends put it on and stuff like that. Like I'll get into the fun. Some of the songs are catchy, but Michael Jackson, she is not. Well, Janet that's Jackson, whole... she is not. Um, you know, on talent, no, no, but and, exactly, but influence, she matters. She's big. She speaks, and millions of white girls under forty will move wherever she points. And as white girls are more grown, it's, it's a lot. Of well, I know, too, I know. So. I'm just, I'm just taking low blows at this point. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm taking shots. I have nieces. Uh, here. I saw yeah. a hilarious meme that was a side by side of like Travis Kelsey with his previous girlfriend uh, when he went out with a black girl, and yeah. he looked, and then now what he looks like going out with Taylor Swift. And it was something like he went, uh, he went from your cousin's uh, nice white boyfriend at the cookout mm -hmm. to an officer who turns off his body cam. <laughs> That's fucked up. <laughs> That's fucked. But here's he, went from, he went from like the fade and the kicks and the, and the clean fits and everything. And like the nice groom beard to straight up like cop stash, but here's right? why and a, right. and a buzz cut. Here's why I think <laughs> I'm just giggling, <laughs> but here's why I think this, this endorsement is huge because in a race that many believe is razor thin right now, it's on the margins. If even and she gets to the 10, point 000... I just made about having shaky support among young people because of the issues, uh, because of uh, the handling of Gaza, Taylor you... Swift is right. about as good as in Taylor Swift is going to give you as much cover as possible to be flimsy on that issue. If you get even five to ten thousand more voters in Pennsylvania, five to ten thousand more voters in Michigan, five to ten thousand more voters in Wisconsin. That's Isn't the election right from there. from Pennsylvania or New Jersey? She's near, she's in the Midwest somewhere, but. I know she's an Eagles fan before being with Travis Kelsey. Like, that was yeah. a thing. So, yeah, uh, yeah, some, some she's from that area. Uh, something like that. But like I said, if you get, she gets even a, a, a slipper of a thousand in certain these battleground states to go vote for her, for Kamala, just because the says so. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, I, it annoys me that it carries weight, but it carries weight. Yeah, it annoys me. But again, you can't have both ways. You can't get mad when celebrity endorses somebody. Oh well, they should stick to stick to singing and stick to. But then when endorses when another celebrity endorses your guy, you're all fucking walls to the walls about it. Well, and I'm the first person to come for Laura Ingram when she tells LeBron and Katie to shut up and dribble. So why can I not tell Taylor Swift to embrace being a childless cat lady and telling Elon Musk and JD Vance to fuck off? I mean, you know, like I, mean, I can't that like that that's hypocritical if nothing yeah. else. Yeah, sure, sure they're rich and out of touch, sure, whatever, but they're also voters. I will make fun, but I won't be a hypocrite. <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> what about Dick Cheney's endorsement? Ugh. Cool. You have something that resembles a conscience after twenty years of or forty years of committing war crimes in your career. I'm glad I'm I, I, I am glad Colin you belong in the Hague, not a voting booth. Let me say this though. And Kamala was smart here. Unless I missed it, she never acknowledged it. She acknowledged the Republican endorsements, didn't say the name because I'm sorry. It's radioactive. You even, don't want to embrace that. Even as somebody who voted for Bush Cheney in 2004 for re election, and I know you did Guilty. too, also especially, that motherfucker is the most unpopular vice president to this day. He was pulling a 9%. I think he is arguably the only vice president in the last 50 years that might have actually had a hand in things that happened yes. while he was in office. Like, I have told people, and I know a lot of my, lot of my friends sit there and say, you know, well, it's the uh, it's another Republican. Yeah, I get that. And I'm not even saying that. I'm not even saying that I don't want him to not vote for Kamala. I'm not even saying that. But I just don't want that endorsement. A lot of I don't like want. I, yeah, it's more like I don't want a camera or a microphone in his face. I don't want a reporter publishing what he talks about. I, the I, man I belongs in jail. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want the attachment Dick Cheney to Kamala Harris because I, I, I would be all too cool. happy to to hand him over to the surviving children of his drone strikes. Like fuck him. Right, right. The guy's a fucking war criminal. So. Yeah, I, I that's that, and that's that's my my only pushback on that whole thing is that and I mean President Bush change. makes me giggle and I and I'm guilty of thinking it's adorable that he and Mrs. Obama are friends and stuff, but like President Bush belongs in the Hague too. He does. They yeah, committed fucking war crimes. Well, question, you know, so both yeah. to be right. I, I'm yeah. Am I happy he endorsed Kamala or is going to vote for Kamala? 
Okay. Yeah, it's well, like, okay, well, I guess if he's not being prosecuted for war crimes, I'm glad he's not voting for President there are Trump, people who but I'd still rather he be prosecuted for war I mean, crimes. I mean, there are people who, who uh, endorse Donald Trump I do like. I just don't like yeah. to endorse him, but, you know, it, it, so who gives a shit? Yeah. And I don't mean that. An endorsement and a vote are two different things. <laughs> can, we, can we stop that? Because for all we know, and I'm not saying he's going to do this. He can endorse him publicly and, and probably. I voted for him. Hillary. I voted for Joe Biden. I did not endorse either one Hell of them. Hell no. I held my nose and it tasted like vinegar when I pulled that fucking lever, you know? Exactly. Exactly. Um, two things we got here. Well, a couple things we got here. I want to talk to you a little bit about this. I don't know how much time we have, we have to discuss this, but this whole Bernie Sanders Donald Trump tunnel. You see it now publicly now with Tulsi Gabbard, RFK Jr., two people who were, I would say, at one point, Bernie Sanders started to 2016 and even 2020 and were have shared policy positions with him. And all of a sudden now they've found their way into the Trump campaign now, Trump, Trump, Trump camp. And so I, I, I mean, wait, 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 okay. And I remember this. I want to let's just speak in a second on this. I remember speaking about this back in 2016 also with you, how like there's a lot of voters that were Bernie bros that end up going for Trump later on. And I think a lot of, and I think at the time you and I spoke about this reason why this happened is because there's a lot of resentment towards Democratic Party for what they did to Bernie, which I acknowledge. Yeah, is up. I, w- I would call it, I would say the biggest culprit to explain that simply is disingenuous yeah. populism. Right. Bernie is a populist, but a populist with mostly integrity. His, his, his actions have more or less aligned with his stated positions and he has appealed to populist elements to gain, to garner support for his positions. Donald Trump, RFK, Tulsi Gabbard, they're disingenuous populists. They're trying to capitalize on that same spirit, but they lack any kind of intellectual or academic integrity, any kind of real policy position in RFK's, in RFK Jr.'s case, a brain that hasn't been eaten by worms. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like they lack any kind of merit to their argument, but they're trying to capitalize on the same thing. And what they end up doing is capturing the populist moron who doesn't actually read or care about what's being said to them. They just like the vibe. They're just there for the party. Yeah. Yeah. They think it's funny. They think it's funny when, when Bernie, you know, poke takes shots at billionaires and talks about bringing people into the political process, but they don't actually care. I acknowledge, I acknowledge though, like they just like getting hugs from chicks at the rally. Right. I acknowledge like Tulsi Gabbard and RFK Jr. both got screwed by Democrats. No one disagrees with that whatsoever. However, for you to uh, go from one end RFK to the other, Jr. should have never been a public figure. Like but, that but he, but man he is, has but no he, that man has right, no but he business is, in our political conversation. And I understand he's only that. Doing it because his daddy was. I, I get know. it, but but he still is though, and he he he, he we also influence. And here's the reality though: he was and, and look, he got look. You don't have to like Harvey Jr. And, and I, I told folks about, about this. Just because you don't like him doesn't mean he has, has a right to not speak at a, at a primary if he's polling enough to do it. Both be right here. Let, let, if, he's, if he's crazy, let, I let him go don't that. entirely agree with that statement. Why? Only because I think there are certain positions that di- I, I'm not saying necessarily his, but I am saying there are positions you can hold that, irrespective of your polling, disqualify you from having a place on the stage. And to me, Holding an anti-vax position is one of those. But if you're, if, but if you're polling twenty percent of the electorate in the Democratic primary, you should be able to have a chance to speak. That's all I'm saying. Let 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 him hang yes himself. Yes and no. Because I I also I also would would apply that to say people who take firmly say racist or genocidal or or dehumanizing positions on issues. I don't care what you're polling. If you think we should put, you know, immigrants in cages, you don't deserve a place on the stage. Like I'm not, I'm not necessarily, I don't necessarily have a problem with somebody telling you that. But that, um, that falls now in the- RFK's case, I do believe in, he got fucked in the beginning. However, he was never a viable or serious candidate. So even if he was technically polling enough to find his way into the primary clown car, like cool. But I, I kind of, I kind of don't hate when the parties do a little bit of house cleaning. Now, when you have somebody like Bernie who's saying things that threaten your front runner and you kneecap their campaign, that's a completely different. Oh, he got you fucked. Know, that's money a, else, he more money else got fucked. 
Yeah, that's legitimately Bernie should nomination. have been the nominee in 2016 and 2020 almost. You like you can argue. Yeah, kinda, kinda. I don't. I think he'd already lost the step by 2020, and it needed still, to be somebody carrying his I torch. Still, but Jim Clyburn fucked him. I still don't understand the whole what. I mean, I, I know you and I have discussed it this podcast quite a few times, but I still don't understand the whole like disconnect between Bernie Sanders and the black community. I I, just, I still don't get, don't get that. That one I've never gotten. That I've never been able to make sense of that because at least from a policy, I mean, other than other than taking an uncommonly hard position on policing that is out of step with even people as progressive as him and including people with black and brown skin as progressive as him in the in, in the public space. Mm-hmm. Um, it's yeah, it never really made sense to me why why he why he failed to resonate with black voters because for the most part, his policies would have done, the, at least as, as far as the 2016 landscape goes, his policies would have arguably done the most for the needs of black people that are not being met. And I guess it's I mean, wages, right. housing, health care, you name it. And I guess black voters mean more so black voters, I guess older voters. I, I guess he has a better inroad with younger voters that are African-American more so than the older ones. Yeah. Now, granted, the rally I went to was in San Diego, so it's not a you know not not a, a vibrant black community of a, of a, in that city anyway. Mm-hmm. But like it was it was pretty white at the the rally that I went to. You know what I mean? Like yeah. out like less diverse than the city reflects. Tulsi Gabbard switched. Though we saw coming from a mile away. I was like, oh yeah. I, I now she's. I don't know what her angle is but it's it's money and influence and it doesn't yeah. have anything to do with issues right she, like, i just need her to go away i i got off the train pretty much like not early but i got off the train by 2021 because i i liked her a lot she, as soon as uh, well she was i i felt badly for her and i thought the way that she got ousted from the dnc Correct. from her position in the dnc like she everything up to that point she seemed like a completely reasonable actor but then once it was plainly apparent that Russian Russia and other actors had a hand in the 2016 election, they were trying to tip the scales of our election. She basically called that nonsense and and started like parroting Russian talking points or at least misinformation talking points that were coming out of these bot farms and stuff like that. And I'm like, Tulsi, where'd your where'd your head go? Yeah. What did you just say? And only that she she stopped talking about. The things that I liked about universal healthcare, UBI, um, the military complex. She stopped talking about that because she was getting more love from the right from the right side. Yeah, it's like I don't know who's I don't know who who's paying her checks and and buying her suits and stuff now for her. But whatever it is, they told her to stop talking about those things. Did you see the uh, the, the, the 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 thing going on with the tenant media and some of the right right wing uh, um, commentators getting? Uh, uh, I guess they got not indicted, but they got uh, subpoenaed because. Um, there's a Russian yeah, it's a whole bunch company. of uh, the only one whose name I can think of off the top of my head is Benny Johnson. Benny Johnson's one. Uh, Dave Rubin's the other one, and Tim Pool. Yeah, and there's Tim a Poole. dozen. There's a dozen or so of them. And, and Lauren all, Chen. Lauren Chen also. Yeah, and basically it came down to that they were financed by a Russian oligarch bot farm, and they just didn't ask where their paychecks were coming from, and they were they were spitting whatever they were told to spit. Right, and, and I'm sorry. And they just didn't question the the money. It, right. If if you're given being given that kind of money and, and you have a media platform, you have to at least question where it's come from. And to anyone who would say, mm, run your check, homie, I'm like, no. No. Stop it. That's the problem with our political system, is everybody's running their check. Listen, listen to Kyle Kalinsky. Because he, he he said it's even worse that they do it because they're the same ones that say corporate media bad, this and that for the same reason that they do the same fucking thing. You you know better and you still do it anyway. That's so you're a fucking hypocrite. So actually, you're worse than CNN because we acknowledge CNN, Fox News, all that stuff. They take money from other out, out, yeah. outside sources. Jake stuff. Tapper doesn't have a problem showing you his fucking Central Park West penthouse. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, so, like, like, so, like they, they, he doesn't they, mind they, telling you he bought a twenty thousand dollar pair of shoes for the Met Gala. Like yeah. he's he's pretty unapologetic about that. Yeah. Joe but, Scarborough has no problem rubbing it in our face that he can fly back and forth between New exactly. York and Florida at but will the, and do whatever the fuck he wants on his show. But right, like, but the, fact, the fact you'll sit here and fuck. 
fucking and sit there and, and say, oh, they're bad for doing that shit. And then you do the same goddamn thing knowing better. And then about you that? try to pretend they're one of us because their profile picture is yeah. them wearing Oakley's in a fucking F-150. They, they're and, making more money. They're making as much or more than the people on MSNBC. And believe me, I'm sure the, the people on the left doing the same shit too. Well, I would not be surprised Israel. if Benny Johnson is taking home more money than Nicole Wallace or Joy Reid. Yeah. He's annoying. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's him. crazy. It's crazy. And that's another another, another grifter, like freaking Tim Pool. Another one. Another one, Bernie, the, the Trump angle. Tim Pool was a vice TV. Him. Tim Pool was a, was, a, was, a, was a Bernie guy. Uh, uh, and now he's, he's a big Trump guy now. And you said he was on Vice? He was on Vice TV for a little while. Yeah, on Vice for a little while. Oh, yeah. Okay. So he, yeah. he, he did a, he's like the, what you're saying is he's the Timu Gavin McInnes? Uh, I guess we're gonna call him that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's an interesting situation. Um, okay, two more things I got here. Uh, so I told you um, that. So I told you a couple years ago actually that I started watching The West Wing. Um, oh, I never. Okay. Ne- uh-huh. I got huh, set up for this one because yeah. I just finished my rewatch too. <laughs> so, so ne- no, no, never. But remember, never finished it during COVID. Um, yeah. Now, right. explain to me, right. did you do the Aaron Sorkin fanboy cutout where you basically just left the show when Sam and Aaron left or when no, no, uh, no. Rob Lowe and I, I just or you stopped. just lost interest and had I, other shit I, going on? I just on. stopped because I got, time got busy. I know football started. I was, I was back to work again and it's kind of okay. – I, I get, what, my problem is one – Because before. there is – I mean there is a contingent of people. I don't know how many of your listeners are West Wing fans, but we're going to start talking about things that West Wing fans already know because we don't have enough time to – Ex- expose it all but right. like there are basically two school there are two kinds of west wing fan there are the people who only watch the first four seasons plus sam's campaign mm-hmm. and then there are people who watch the whole series because they are effectively two different shows okay like when john wells takes over the series it's a completely different so i series. never i never actually got that far i got to season three and a half oh okay so, yes yeah, so, so you never experienced the shit the title shift right like, <laughs> so, so so the wife and i restarted the show again um recently went back I, to the pilot was, sam went to hooker the whole nine yeah was i love her i love the hooker by the way i loved her oh Maybe yeah now. well and she's cute she and well she and rob Lowe, i believe have been like very close friends their whole life because she's been in a bunch of stuff that he's done since like I wish she, stuck she played his wife, his on again, off again wife oh, really? on nine on nine one one Texas. Uh, oh really? I, I didn't know that. Nine one one Lone Star or whatever they call it. Yeah, that's interesting. So the woman who the woman who plays Lori the prostitute, Lori the call girl, plays Rob Lowe's wife in nine one one. I love that. I love that about her. No, I I, I had no idea. I think your name's um, Lisa Edelston. Yes, that's her name. Yes, correct. Yeah, Lisa Edelston. No, she's cute, dude. She was cute. Lady back then, anyway. Oh yeah. yeah. This uh, 25 years ago. Well, she had a great, she had a great way of like, she was sort of the, per, like to me at that time, like she was a perfect cast for a prostitute in law school. You yeah, know she, what I mean? She was very classy. Like, she was a prostitute. She hit classy all, shit, the, all the bits. Like, yeah, like hell, you can, though. you can take her, you can hire her to be your date to a party at the white house. Well, like, I would have, sm- you know, I, I would have smashed. I would have smashed. Cause I ain't know right now. Um, but anyway, um, so now we're watching it again. Um, we are now midway through season three. So we're, we're around the time where I left. Oh, I thought you wrapped it. Okay. No, no, I no, thought no, you were no, already no, done. No, 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 I'm still right now. He hasn't started his campaign yet, but re-election campaign yet. But he's a. Uh, he's but you're you've just gotten through MS and yeah, yeah. Um, the, the reveal and and Oliver and Babish Black. and uh, yeah. I mean, you know it's funny when you when you when you brought him up Oliver Babish he came in the episode the episode after right, literally after I was like oh that's the guy Mark's talking about. <laughs> he's like, was it in Le Monde? Or when she, when she was he's like, it was all in the newspaper. He's like, was it in Le Monde? <laughs> 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 I only read Le Monde. <laughs> so where, where does West Wing rank among, among your favorite shows of all time? Top three. Is it top three for real? Okay. Yeah. It's ER, West Wing, Newsroom. E- ER's that high for you? ER's one. Wow. You know, you know, you know I never watched ER in full? I've, oh, yeah. I've watched it in full at least five or eight times. Like, And it's a 15-season show with 24 episodes a season. And worth it. And I've watched it through, at, yeah, at least half a dozen times. So you're a, you're a George Clooney fanboy. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> without getting too deep into the ER of it all and taking us off the West Wing thing, because mm-hmm. those two these two shows do actually kind of go hand in hand in a lot of ways. Right. Um, and after you finish West Wing, I would advise you watching ER because it would be curious to see like considering ER started 
six years before the West Wing and did two years after. Um, and there is a shit ton of overlap, principally mm -hmm. that ER is a John Wells production. And then John Wells took over West Wing when Sorkin got pushed out. Right. So there's just a ton of casting overlap. There's a lot of thematic and storytelling elements. It's there's just a lot of there's a lot of West Wing in ER and a lot of ER in West Wing. I've heard about that too. Uh, also. I've heard that at least once Sorkin leaves. Um, for example, uh, uh, Bradley Whitford plays yeah. a dad Josh who Lyman. loses uh, a dad whose wife dies giving uh, birth. Uh, like he loses his wife in childbirth. Um, and Anthony Edwards has a whole thing and it becomes a malpractice thing. And it was right before he got picked up for, for mm -hmm. West Wing. Um, but no, my thing with ER is I started watching it when I was probably 20, when it was in reruns on, mm -hmm. it was still, the show was still running. It had like three seasons. It was out in the nineties. I remember, I remember the show being on yeah, back, then, I, back then. I wasn't a big TV guy at that point. I, I finished I, the last three seasons of ER, like in real time appointment viewing in front of my TV at 10 o'clock on Thursday. Okay. Uh, because I got so into it in college. So it was running on, it was like, I didn't like early classes. I didn't like going to school before 10 or 12. Uh, but I would stay until like six. I would take classes until five or six because I didn't right. mind that. So in the mornings, ER would run for like five hours from basically like seven to noon, back to back episodes of ER on TNT every day, five mm -hmm. days a week. Right. So every day when I'm like laying in bed, finishing my homework, getting ready for school, doing whatever, I kind of, I just picked up watching ER and then through enough reruns was able to more or less piece the show together. And then during that big strike that lasted like two years in like 05 or 06, the one that like fucked up Entourage and Breaking Bad and like interrupted all these shows, um, ER was obviously one of them. So I had time in that strike to um watch the entire series of er in order and it's yeah it's hands down my favorite show and the thing i've learned is over time every rewatch i identify with different characters differently based on where i'm at in my life because like i said i started watching the show when i was 19 20 right. and now i'm 40 so it was like in the beginning i had a lot more like i i related a lot more to like noah wiley and then other points in my life, I've related a lot more to like George Clooney or uh, Eric LaSalle or something like that. And yeah. then more Anthony Edwards. And then now it that. freaks me out to watch it because Anthony Edwards, Dr. Green, he his death is heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And he died three years younger than I am right now. Like I texted another friend of mine who she rewatches ER all the time. And I'm like, <gasps> did you know Dr. Green is younger than us? He died younger than we are now. And she's like, I hate you. Don't ever tell me that again. <laughs> 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 but no, okay so you're season three west wing which means yeah, yeah we're gearing up for the campaign um yeah for, for the debate with governor ritchie is one of my favorite episodes yeah. yeah has the black vera wang episode happened where they go to the play in new york and like cj's getting death threats and has a secret service agent staying with her no not yet i th okay i think that's the end of season three that's really gnarly. That whole arc of okay. CJ being of CJ being stalked, yeah. and then the guy who uh, her Secret Service agent is the guy who stars in NCIS. Okay, the guy with like the center part. He, he looks he looks like a cop or a federal agent or a soldier okay. or something okay. like that. He just has he's got that square jaw white boy look, you know. Um, anyway, that's a great arc. That's right. a three. It, I think that's the last like three, four episodes of the third season, and then four is the campaign. Okay. Okay. I okay. Think. I'll definitely uh, check it. Out. I I I'll, I just texted wife now. Ask you never seen it before. Maybe she'll add it to our list of shows to watch. Our, ER. Our, our old couple. Yeah, I'm gonna ask her now. I just asked her. So I will say the first season is the hardest to get through because it feels more like an eighty. It feels more like Saint Elmo's Fire or not Saint Elmo's Fire. What was um. What was the big medical show in the 80s with St. Elmo's Place? St. Elmo's okay. Place. That's uh, also uh, Rob Lowe. Uh, St. Elmo's Fire, Rob Lowe. St. Elmo's Place, though, was Anthony Edwards. Oh, he was oh yeah, 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 yeah. Happened. Sorry, yeah. I got it that was the hospital show with William Daniels, Mr. Feeney mm -hmm. yeah. in the 80s. So ER actually feels a little more St. Elmo 
than like modern show in the first season because they were running on like a shoestring budget. They didn't have all their stuff, but then immediately second season, it feels like apart from the wardrobe and the shape of the computers and stuff, like it feels like a a show that we would watch right now. And it stays that way all the way to the end. And it's very cool to see like technology and society shift across a 15 year show. Right. Right. All right. One last thing out of here. So one thing I will ask you this as we're really quick. Yeah. Is it weird to you or frustrating to you watching the West wing and seeing them having the same debate almost down to the talking point? That we're, you know, they're talking about some of the same shit 25 years ago. Oh, yeah. And we're having literally like tit for tat. The, like, you could lift scripts from the West Wing into these conversations we're having. Especially like the religious, the, the early on in, in the season where you had religious people come in there trying to dictate what they should. Oh, in the, in the, yeah, in the, the pilot when yeah. Mary Marsh and Al yeah. Caldwell come and yeah. they try to take Josh out to the woodshed and then President right. Bartlett gives them a whole fucking thing yeah. on the, Raggedy Ann doll with a knife. That was his room. intro to the show, I think. I'm mistaken. That was his intro. Well, to the show, I so yeah, yeah uh, originally the show was supposed to be just about the White House staff, and the right. president would just kind of be like a cameo periodically. But Martin Sheen crushed it so well he's as so President Bartlett. Good. He's so good. In the role. Ah, president Bartlett is so wonderful. Yeah. Like, he's so funny. Like, More- there's so many lines in that show between him. Dulé Hill, Stalker mm-hmm. Channing, and John Spencer. That like Stalker no matter how, too. yeah, she and Martin Sheen have like an incredible on-screen uh, back and forth. Mm-hmm. Like their their dialogue and their arguments are so believable. Yeah. Um, but there there are still just so many one-liners uh, between the four of them that just crack me up. Like. Uh, when Leo is going through his confirmation or his uh, getting grilled by uh, the house about uh, about his rehab and stuff. Yeah. And he's got the president on the phone and he's asking uh, and the president's asking about him flirting with his lawyer, Jordan. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I like you two together. You're like a 50 screwball comedy. He goes, you're like a 50 screwball. Best character in the show for me is still Leo McGurry. Leo oh yeah, Leo, Leo uh, is absolutely my favorite character on the show. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, he's he's, he's loyal to the president. He's straight shooter. Boom, boom, boom. That's it. Um, <laughs> he's hel- last thing's he's out of here. Hilarious. He is. One more thing's out of here. I got, I got five minutes. Um, yesterday was twenty three anniversary. Twenty three anniversary of nine eleven. Your your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. where, were, where, where were you nine eleven? Where were you uh, twenty three years ago? Did that what happened? In, <clears throat> in bed, waiting to go to high school. I was a senior in high school when it happened. And uh, I'm going to skip over that because we talked about this a little bit before. And I'm going to read what I wrote uh, on my okay. Instagram story because that's just a whole lot easier. I got to switch screens as we do this. No worries. We're, we're shuffling and juggling. Well, I'm not going to bring it up myself on the screen to myself. Hold on. I'm just going to bring it up. Okay. Because I, I sent it to you. Like I, 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 know, box, I know you did. Right? But, but, yeah, I know, I know you did. But it might be, it okay. might be up. Let me see if I can. Uh, uh, is it Francois Mark um, on there? It's same Mark. So see, oh, it's you. You won't be able to bring it up on my. I can just send you the picture if you want. No, I'm talking, I'm talking on the screen here. I'm talking on the oh screen. yeah, you can bring up my Instagram story uh, yeah, and, and have it on the I'll screen. Do, I'll do it right you now. Do that. You know, my Frank Swad, eight percent. Yeah, that is right there. Let's see if I can bring it up here. Could just pop up and see. Right, I almost right because it's long enough. I almost want to read this in Vince Scully's voice, but I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be that irreverent. Well, um, I right here, I right here, but I don't know if I can stop it. Like, like, yeah, I go, there you go. I got it right here. Got it right here. Um, just bring it up on the screen. So you got the first one where it starts I, every year. I sure do. Hold on. All right. Give me one second. Can you see that? Uh, I'm reading. I'm looking at it on my phone. So I I switched off of the uh the pod okay. feed so that I could read it. Okay, but I can see you can see it here too pod, as well. I won't be. Yeah, I can see that it's up, but I wouldn't be able to read the text. All right, go ahead. Phone. Every year, it's the same flurry of disingenuous nonsense, recalling where people were when they found out and how inspiring the national unity was in the wake of the attack. What I found myself re- reflecting upon is that while the loss of 2000, over 2,000 Americans was tragic, the cost of our response was imme- immeasurably worse. As of September 2021, the Watson Institute estimated that 432,000 civilians in the post-9-11 wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and other countries had been killed. 
Also, the Watson Institute estimates that 3.6 to 3.8 million people have died indirectly in post 9-11 war zones, bringing the total death toll to at least four and a half to 4.7 million. Wow. Washington Post reports that 38 million people have been displaced or made refugees as a result of the post 9-11 wars. And the United States federal government has spent over eight trillion dollars on it. That's what I'll never forget. Also, mm -hmm. second second slide. Yep, yep. Let us not forget the millions of Americans who enlisted to avenge 9-11, only to be sent halfway around the world for two decades in pursuit of poppy, oil, and petty animus. And now, like, this is one I take issue with personally because, like, this is our friends and peers. Like, the dudes we went to school with were the first ones through the fucking door in Kuwait and Iraq and everywhere else. And, like, the government has absolutely shit on them. Mm -hmm. Of the roughly $8 trillion we've spent, a measly pittance has gone back to the veterans who waged this war and the true heroes of Lower Manhattan who charged into the towers and worked the piles. Republicans love to tell us to support the troops and then shoot down fucking bills when uh, firemen and cops that were in the towers and workers who were clearing the piles uh, have cancer now. I don't give them any money or any doctors. Can't have that. Yep. To put in the parlance of Star Wars, we are the empire, not the rebel alliance. The sooner more Americans realize this, the sooner we may be actually begin to divide, uh, begin to bridge the chasm which divides most of us. And one final thought on the quote unquote unity uh, in this country following the 9-11 attacks, mm -hmm. utter nonsense. In the immediate aftermath and for many years after, the response to 9-11 contributed to a horrific climate of Islamophobia in this country, lest we forget the Patriot Act. In our moment of collective national trauma, our leaders utilized propaganda to mislead us while dehumanizing the victims of our fury. Cat, uh, Cat Williams got a whole bit about how they just call them insurgents. I don't even know what an insurgent is. I don't got no insurgent friends. That mm -hmm. right there. Like that's how the media desensitizes us to dropping fucking predator drones on birthday parties in search of one suspected terrorist. That's how we get that. Additionally, thousands of Middle Eastern, Desi, in Muslim Americans, also North African Americans, were victims of vigilante attacks and harassment by intelligence agencies, which were early in the years following 9-11. Shows like Homeland, for example. Great, great depiction of this sort of climate. Mm -hmm. The first, if I recall, was an elderly Sikh man who was beaten by white folks to death uh, in the days following 9-11. So, yes, 9-11 was tragic. Yes, there were many heroes on 9-11, and there are many things for which we, 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 you know, never forget, of course. But we have to be full, full spectrum about this. Like, we spent $8 trillion killing 5 million people. Three, somewhere between 2 and 3 million Americans participated in this conflict. Suicide is the number, or uh, excuse me, the, what is it? The number, uh, the number one group of people who commit the most suicide are, are veterans, or it's that uh, veterans have the highest rates of suicide of any other Americans. Mm -hmm. um, and the VA shits on these people. Look no further than uh, the VA complex in LA, where they gave land to UCLA and private schools, and they sweet when that land was granted there for the sole purpose, for the expressed and exclusive purpose of housing veterans from the Civil War. Uh, now they have them in porta potties they call tiny homes. And when they have the audacity to pitch a tent to protect themselves from the elements, they call LA County Sheriff to come sweep them out. Yeah, That's what we do to the, to the heroes of 9-11, to the heroes of the Iraq War. So fucking spare me. And here we are again another year we've got a nearly trillion dollar defense budget veterans don't have benefits military families are struggling like anybody else housing costs health care food security education all in the shitter but we got plenty of money to send weapons all over the country because northrop raytheon boeing ge amf uh, the list goes on even ball like ball mason jars that's a defense contractor now like they don't even make jars no more that brand is made by somebody else, but the company ball, like the ball arena, it's a defense contractor, AMF, the bowling alleys, defense contractor. They make like aviation stuff, missile parts, like general dynamic, all these companies. We learned fighting World War II 
when we transferred roughly 25% of the world's wealth to ourselves, that war is good business. Yep. And the people who got rich on World War II are not letting that go until our republic falls, unless we make them. Simple as that. So spare me all the fucking flowery 9-11 stuff and tear-jerking videos that are trying to manipulate us into being star-spangled patriots when we see dust-covered faces walking down 2nd Avenue or whatever. Stop it. Yeah. Quit quit pissing on my leg and telling me it's raining. <clears throat> uh, Real quick before I get out of here. Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? Where's that? <sighs> Never mind. I saw a poll here, but I think the poll's not up yet. Okay, never mind. Oh, okay. Rasmussen poll it doesn't matter. Um, mm. I know it's mostly right leaning, but whatever. No, nine eleven is uh for me. It's uh all that stuff too. Especially as you, as you said, I've I've come to terms with that. Especially too, it, but it's it's a lot more sure. complicated. I was flying flags in my car and screaming "fuck Iraq" in two thousand two. We all were. I was. Actually, we all got lied to. I think you know my story of 9-11, right? I think you know my story. I was actually in New York a day before. Yeah, you know the story, but I was. I was. I went to Michael Jackson concert that weekend. His last show was actually the night before it happened on September tenth. Um, yeah. at, Madison Square, at Madison Square Garden. Um, of course. So that a lot of my friends. I I almost stayed for this, the second show. I went to the first show on the seventh of September. Went almost stayed for the second show on the Monday, and then decided not to go because I had to go to work, whatever that kind of thing. But I almost stayed for the second show. But all my friends stayed for the second show. And we're my, in the city when it happened. Yeah. Now, my friend Jen, who was in the Square One documentary, I tell you about. Yeah. She left. Well, was one of the last flights to leave New York that morning before the, the plane hit. She was one of the last flights out of New York before the plane hit. <sighs> back, to, back to Ohio. So. Yeah. Yeah. My it's a lot of, uh, had another one like that. He was supposed to be on the flight. Uh, he was supposed to be on United 93. But that, something Michael? happened and he had to change his job. Michael? My, a friend of mine in high school, his oh, dad oh, okay. was, a, oh, yeah. was an attorney for the IRS. And something happened where, like, they rescheduled the thing, and so he didn't mm. end up having to go to Boston, or he had to go to St. Louis instead, so they changed yeah. his flight. But he, oh, that's what it was. He had been in Boston, and he was supposed to fly back to L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, to come home, and he got redirected to St. Louis, and that took him off United 93. Oh, wow. Like, he was booked God on United him, 93, man. and then they changed his flight. Yeah, something like that. God bless him. And it's twenty years ago, twenty five years ago, almost. I don't remember every yeah. detail of it, but yeah, it was something very freaky like that. It's, 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 it was so close to situation. Sometimes you don't even realize how close we are to situation. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like death reaching out for you, and his like little bony finger gets right to your shoulder, and then something yanks it away. Yeah. You know, and there's a reason why it <sighs> happens always. You know, I mean, the, but the butterfly effect they call that, right? Yeah. So, anyway, Mark, good job as always. Any anything want to plug we got here? Not today. Nothing special other than always, always, always connect with us. Uh, HAC, the Haitian American Caucus. We always need your help. We've got a lot of good work going on right now in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. um, our school in Haiti, unfortunately, is still not back up and running. It's, you know, in the in the heart of quite a bouquet and in, in, in ground zero for all of the conflict and gang violence and whatnot that's taking place. And we've not been able to rebuild since we got ransacked. So we need money. Give us your money so we can rebuild. Um, and then, of course, all of our wonderful services for uh, migrants, Haitians, immigrants in uh, New York and New Jersey. Our migrant center down in Hamilton, New Jersey, is, is firing on all cylinders. We've got lots of different programs running. So always connect with us uh, at HAC underscore US on Instagram or HACglobal.org uh, online. Uh, go Dodgers. Yeah, show yeah, yeah. A, show yeah. A. yeah, yeah, yeah. And good job as always. <laughs> good job as always, brother. Thanks, man.